but if you haven't seen it, you're missing a blessing. Every time I've been, I've looked around and saw men with water in their eyes. I've been one of them. And uh, it's been a blessing, brother. Thank you. Uh, that uh, tribute to our veterans is special. It really is. Hallelujah. But I guess what gets us all is the realization, and like I've told you before, I have my dad's one of six boys in his family, and I think all of them but him were in World War II. He's the only one. He, he went in the Air Force the year after the war, uh, but uh, he was too young. But all the rest of them were over there and actually had, I think it was four between England and France D-Day uh, out there in that water and, and in boats and everything else. But thank you, brother. Thank you. I thank you for what you do. And in all honesty, this, I want to try to take us in a direction. Jonathan has just basically ruined me. Um, you've been singing that song about um, I am who you say I am. Been singing it pretty regular for the last month or two, some for a while. And I really like it. I really like it. But this last two weeks, I couldn't get it out of my head. Y'all ever had something you just couldn't get out of your head? And, uh, I just haven't been able to get it out of my head. I even thought, well, I gotta, I gotta go catch it up and learn it for sure. Now I can't get that little flat. Uh, uh, he, the sun sets you free. You're free indeed. And um, I am who you say I am. Those two lines, I just ain't been able to lose them. They've been going with me everywhere I go. And uh, so I, I, I can't help it. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to preach on it. I apologize. Uh, but the, in order for me to get it out of my head and get it behind me, so I can go on to something else, I gotta deal with it. And um, I am who you say I am. And that's, that's powerful thought when you get down to it and you think about it. I am who you say I am. Now, I'm not going to do this in a uh, chronological order. That means time frame. I'm not going to do it really in a frame of uh, from least important to most important. I'm going to try to just go through uh, systematically, go from Matthew on back through with uh, several uh, statements about who Jesus, who God says we are or what we've got. And, uh, and if you've got a Bible and you're willing to turn there, in uh, Matthew chapter 5 is where we'll start. Matthew chapter 5. And uh, you, are, you, you are who God says you are. And I want to point out a few things that we need to realize that God says about us. And uh, walk through some of these right quick if I can. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. You probably know them by heart. It says, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Let's pray. Lord, your word for your glory. And may it be, God, you'd help us to spend a few minutes uh, looking at things that you say about us, Lord, and what you tell us we are. Help us to realize, God, that through the, your word we can understand what we are empowered and enabled to do and help us to do it, Lord, for your glory. Then we know it will be good for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 says, Ye are the salt of the earth. Now, that's just you and me, say, folks, Christians, we are to be the salt of the earth, wherever it is we go. And there's one thing I trust all of you ladies realize, and I hope all of us know, salt, listen, listen to this, salt always makes a difference. You add salt, it's either going to get too salty or, or, or get tasting better one. Salt will always make a difference. And you and I are supposed to make a difference. Wherever it is we're at, work, play, school, uh, whatever we got going on in our lives, where we go as Christians, we are supposed to make a difference. Salt always makes a difference. And I trust that you realize that you and I were not put here to just go out there and live our life and then uh, act like everything's the same and everything's normal and everybody look at us and feel just fine, hunky dory. No, no, no. We are supposed to make a difference. By looking at you and looking at me, people should see something of God, something of Jesus Christ that catches their attention. You and I are the salt of the earth. And here in this verse of Scripture, Jesus talking now, and Jesus said, but if you lose your saltiness, 
You're not good for anything. Woo, that's pretty sharp, but that's what he says. That's what he says. That's one thing that I would say to you. You need to realize Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. Look at verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. And a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. You can't hide the light. Uh, light is fast. I don't remember what that was. Anyway, it moves. Oh, by the way, it's always moving. Light does not stay still. It is always in process, going somewhere. And, and light has the ability, now listen to this, to always chase darkness away. Darkness stays. Darkness just is there. It doesn't move. It's just there. It's, 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 you know, I started to bring a flashlight and try to do a little illustrating up here. But the simple truth is darkness stays in one place. Light always chases darkness away. And the darkness of the world, without any debate, without any doubt, uh, we understand we're talking about that which is evil, that which is sinful, that which is ungodly. That is the dark things of the world. And we could go down a long list, and you know that. But now here's the thing. We who are the light of the world are supposed to chase away the darkness. But we don't usually, do we? Especially today. They've got today where they don't care whether you're the light or not. They're just going to keep being dark and doing their thing. And I've told you several years ago about going to visit that senior member of our church up in Dodge County, and she was a senior lady, a sweet little old lady. And I went by to visit, and I walked up to her uh, place, and I, I knocked on her front door. And when I knocked on her front door, there was a big uh, front window right there next to the door. And I uh, looked through that window as I knocked on the door, and I could see she was sitting in a recliner right there. But as soon as I knocked on that door, I saw what she did. She had a beer in her hand, and she took it and hid it behind the chair. Oh, and I knocked, and then she says, come in. And I come in, she had it hiding behind her, hoping I wouldn't see it. It was already seen. It was too late. But I, I didn't say anything to her. I didn't get on to her. I did not, uh, whatever. But here's the point. Light, I was the light, okay? I was supposed to be the light. And when I came up, she knew the darkness of alcohol did not supposed to be there. And she wanted to hide it in the darkness. That's the way it's supposed to be. You and I are supposed to make a difference where we go. We're supposed to taste different. We have that saltiness about us. And we're supposed to illuminate the place so that that which is bad and evil is revealed and it wants to go and hide somewhere. Yeah, well, I'm saying there's two things there brought up that... God says, I am, what I, I am what he says I am. Okay, he says I'm the salt of the earth. He says I'm the light of the world. If you've got your Bibles, we'll turn over a little further. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1, and verse 12. John, chapter 1, and verse 12. And it says this. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So hold on. A third thing that we got to realize, God says, I am a child of the king. I am. You are. You say, you're a child of the king. You're, we are sons and daughters of God. Now, we ain't going to have any better family. That's us. We are part of the family of God. That's right there. It's time to start saying amen, hallelujah. Uh, when you stop and back up and realize, well, I'm part of the family of God. What's, what's going on here? Well, I'm supposed to act like part of the family of God. Had a guy in Dodge County. He was a little bit of a shady character, if you want to know the truth. But he had uh, two sons and a daughter, and he came to church. And I'll never will forget, uh, he came to church and visited us one week. And the next week, on a Thursday afternoon, our little church burned to the ground. Uh, a last Thursday in December, or January, I believe it was, of a 19, anyway, it burned. And um, I was standing there in the parking lot, hundreds of people out there in the country, but it, this fire was seen for miles, it was, it was heavily broadcast and everything else, and there were piles of people out there, nothing they could do, it, it was an old block building with uh, uh, all the wood in it was fat lighted, I guarantee you, and it, it got hot, it got hot and burned fast. But I still remember standing there, and this man who had brought his, his sons and daughter to church the Sunday before stood there and standing behind me, and I heard him say it. He turned to his son, and he said, I told you good things don't happen when you go to church. I'm serious. 
I want to go around there and slap him. But he did. He said that. He said, I told you bad things happen when you go to church. Oh, man. What kind of nut was he? But we are supposed to be part of the family of God, and we're supposed to uh, have a, an impression. on His family was given the impression that they were all evil. They were all bad. Oh, no, 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 not so, not so. We're a part of God's family. Just kind of let that sink in. You know, you might have a family member somewhere back in the bushes you really don't want to brag on. But we're part of God's family. And that'll brag. That'll brag. Well, excuse me, you ain't supposed to brag. <laughs> I tell you, you're not supposed to brag. But it sure will make us feel good to know we're a part of that family. Every now and then, you know, I, I see, uh, we hear somebody talk about where they came from and what's happening over there and, and uh, it's, it's the bloodline is, well, I, I mentioned this about the, the preacher saying he was from South Africa County and all that, and it kind of made me feel good. And, you know, uh, but, but wait a minute. We tell you you're a part of the family of God. Genuinely, honestly, biblically, according to the scriptures here, whenever we got saved, we became sons and daughters of God. What more do you need? You're heading the right direction. I am who he says I am. I'm part of his family. Part of his family. John's Gospel, chapter 14, uh, verse 2. John, chapter 14. I know we've just been going through these verses, but it's just, just showing something that the Bible says we are. John, chapter 14. We are home owners you got that in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you unto myself that where i am there ye may be also god has prepared us a home a place and as we've told you on several occasions uh, that famous preacher friend of mine, Paul Dennis, well, he's famous with hunting clubs anyway, and uh, he, he always said, God don't make no junk. And if God has gone and prepared a place for us, you can rest assured it is not just a corner, a cabin in the corner of glory land. It's not. God's prepared dwelling places. If you stop and think about those of us in the room who are willing to admit a while ago that we have lived long enough that we remember outhouses, and if you can stop and realize how far we have come from those days, which is my lifetime, my kinfolk across the creek over there, several of them, I guess all of them that lived over there back then, they all had outhouses. We took, we took a bath in a wash tub on the back porch or either under the, wash, the water hose in the backyard. That was it. I mean, you know, I remember the, the running water was not in the kitchen it was out the back door of the kitchen on that walkway that connect the house to the uh, place where we used to eat, that room out there, all those things. But no, wait a minute, we ain't got that now, do we? You see, we're, all of us, the, the, the worst off person among us is better off than we were back then. Oh, let that sink in. But God's going to prepare something better for us. You can rest assured it will outdo whatever it is we've got now. But please hear me. God says he's got a place for you, a place, your own. Hallelujah. I'm going over a little further in your Bibles, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, talking about what God says that I am. God says I am in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I, is what it says here, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. God says that you and I, if we are his children, part of his family, we have been empowered. I remember a story about a guy, a uh, church over in Alabama, that um, had a visitation program that was successful back in those days. It's been 50 years ago. And there was one member of the church who, well, he had some limitations. Um, he, he had trouble communicating with people. 
but he's faithful to church. And he'd go. Lord, he'd be there. And uh, they had a list of names of folks who had moved into the community. And it was one of the towns over in Alabama that would, lived in a, a, a town that had uh, a college. And so, therefore, there was a lot of college students coming and going. And, and they went to visitation one night, and there was a list of, of college boys and girls who had moved into the town over the previous couple of weeks. And, uh, and he took a, a card that had two guys' names on it who were rooming there uh, going to college. And he said, I I'll go there. And he went. And he, he did. He kind of stuttered when he talked a little bit and uh, didn't really communicate all that well. But, but he could. He, you could talk to him. You could understand him. But I, I remember the story that they told about him. said that he took those two names of the college kids in that town, and he went to see them. He got over and knocked on the door, and they come to the door, and they said, uh, Who are you? And he introduced himself and said, My name is, and I'm from such and such a church over here, and I just want to come by and since you've uh, moved in here, we want to invite you to church. And they immediately began to make fun of him. And it was obvious. You know, mocking him, and the way he talked, his mannerisms. And they, they mocked him. And, but they invited him, yeah, come on in. And, and they got him in there, and they, they mocked him and made fun of him. And he sat there in front of them and, and began to try to tell them why he was there. He was there to invite them to church and let them know that uh, Jesus loved them. And finally, after a little bit, he, he realized it was obvious. They were just making fun of him. And he stopped and he said, okay, I know I'm not like you. I don't have the same skills that you've got. But if I die tonight, I know where I'm going. Do you? And it kind of got their attention. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We have been empowered, even if we do have limitations. My goodness, David Ring. We don't need to say anything. If you know who David Ring is, Lord have mercy. Anybody with all of his limitations and inabilities, but yet he has been used by God so mightily, so powerfully. Even if you do have to sit there for 10 minutes and listen to him before you can finally figure out what he's saying. <laughs> and that's what I had to do. When I finally called on, I could, I could figure out the way he was talking. and all. But he wound up, and he still, he's willing to go and do it. He's willing to go and do it. We have been empowered. Take a deep breath. Pray and ask for God to help you, guide you, direct you, and go do it. Go use the power that God's given. But now, wait a minute, right there in that same verse of Scripture, it is not only that, that we have been empowered, but we have been empowered to witness. A and ye shall be witnesses. I trust you understand that, and I, I don't know the right way to do this, I don't uh, English teacher probably should help us, uh, but it looks to me like something's in the infinitive or the declarative or, or anyway, it says you shall be. It doesn't mean you can be. It doesn't say you can be. It says you shall be. Oh, by the way, I guess we can be good witnesses or maybe bad witnesses. You ever seen a bad witness? Yeah, I bet you have. Somebody who attend the church and I remember one day we was working in Warner Robins and I was in the cabinet shop, working in the cabinet shop. There was just four of us and, and we took our morning break, or I think it was our evening break, and we went next door to the little neighborhood store and it wasn't a 7-Eleven or whatever, but it was just a neighborhood country type store and we went there to get us a, a coat and a honey bun or whatever for break. And I can still remember as we walked around the corner because right next door and started to go toward the building, we looked and there was a member of Second Baptist Church coming out the door with his little brown bag, you know. And uh, he got in his car and drove off as we was walking across the, the parking lot. We went inside, and I'll never forget. The guy that was in there was rough. The guy that run that store. Oh, he, he cussed bad, foul mouth in a lot of ways. And I remember as we walked in there and picked up our Coke or whatever we were getting and stepped up to the counter, he looked at us and laughed. Yep, there goes one of your faithful members down there at Second Baptist Church. I know where he goes. I sell him his beer every week. Yep. And we didn't know what to say. What do you say? Bad witness. That's what he was. You see, you've got to realize there's folks watching. You know, there are folks watching. They drive by right out here on Sunday morning when church is in session and they see whose cars are here and whose ain't. Mm-hmm. 
don't know who's at church. We've been empowered. We have been enabled. But unfortunately, we can use our abilities to be a bad witness for the cause of Christ. I don't know how many times I've stood around and listened to people telling their jokes. And unfortunately, church members, church leaders, telling those shady jokes and laughing about them. No, 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 no. No, that's not a good witness. That's not a good witness. Let me carry you on over in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, just showing you some things that God says we are and that we have. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Oh, boy. I, I think maybe uh, the governor at New York and some of those other folks who think it's okay for you to decide what you're going to do with the baby that's inside of you if you're female and you happen to be pregnant, and that that's, you know, it's your body, you decide. No, 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 that ain't what the Bible says. That is not what the Bible teaches for folks who are Christians. Our bodies are the temple of God, God's Holy Spirit. And this is, I don't really understand all this. All I know is I'm thankful for it. There is actually, according to these scriptures, inside of Daryl Quinn, the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Let that sink in. I'll never go without him anywhere I go. Well, He's with us. He's in me. He's in you. I'm trusting that everybody in this room has made a decision for Christ. And if you have, then and you have accepted Christ as your Savior, then inside of you is the third part of the Trinity of God. Hallelujah. Oh, my. Oh, my. You are the temple of the Lord. Glory. Let me take you a little further. Book of 2 Corinthians, over a few pages in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. One of my favorite verses. It might be the first verse I memorized after Jesus wept. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Read it for what it says. Read it, read it with the realization of the absolute that's included in this, the, de the declaration of these statements uh, that uh, anybody in Christ is a new creature. Glory. Uh, maybe maybe y'all weren't as sorry as I was. I'm serious. Before I accepted Christ as my Savior at the age of 21, I was a rotten Sorry, church-going person. I went faithfully just to keep my mama satisfied. And, um, but I got to tell you right now, when I got saved, I got turned around. The Lord took Daryl Quinn and, and made something happen. It's different. It's not the same anymore. I have been changed. And, and that verse of Scripture says, I have been made a new creature, a new creation, some translations say. And, and, it said, and the old things are passed away. The old things are passed away. You pass away. It's forgiven. And that's part of the song, ain't it? Uh, I, he says, I am forgiven. I, I'm, uh, I'm chosen. I'm forgiven. Yeah, well, we are forgiven. That means all them dirty things that you used to do that you've asked God to forgive you for, they are gone. You will not be held accountable for them. Whew. Am I the only one that means that? No. Uh, well, no, wait a minute. You read that verse of Scripture and take it to heart and realize what it's talking about. I can, I can always look back in my life and remember on that day when I accepted Christ as my Savior, there was a difference made. There was a change that took place in Daryl Quinn, and, I, and I've cherished it ever since. Thank God for it. Hallelujah. And that is something that God says happens to us when we get saved. We become new. He cleans us. He, he, somehow, through the Holy Spirit and the blood of the cross, He washes all the filth and the dirty away. I've got a jacket at home. I got about 20 years ago. Um, it was given to me from California. Uh, it is. That's where they, they bought it and brought it back from California and gave it to me. And it's a warm jacket, nice jacket, thick jacket. Um, and it's, it was uh, a blue, like navy blue, and I don't know, um, 
red. I'm talking about uh, apple red. It's beautiful. I liked it. Well, I've had it for nearly 20 years. My wife finally said, you, you, <laughs> you need a little cleaning up. And so she decided she's going to wash my red and blue jacket. I don't know what it's made out of. It's reversible. Uh, outside it's supposed to be rainproof, you know, and all that stuff. And you turn it around. And anyway, the inside's that woolly stuff. Full, uh, like, and it's real nice. But I guess it's not as nice as we thought. Because when she washed it, it ain't red no more. Ain't no red on it. And I am serious. It had, it had red about halfway the sleeves and, and, and about halfway up to your belly button. It was red. And it had a lot of red on it. Red and blue. Red and blue. All the red. I started to bring it tonight. I'm serious. I was, I was in the bedroom and I was getting out there. And I, I don't want to take that coat. They won't believe me. It is white. And I'm, I'm, I'm right, honey? Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, man, yeah. Uh, it's white. <laughs> it's dark blue and white. Something about, I don't know what kind of washing the powders my wife uses, but they're good. <laughs> they get rid of the, the, the bad. Oh, you know Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. I'm going to wear that jacket with pride. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. See, what I'm trying to get you to realize is this. Here the Word of God is teaching us that Jesus Christ takes all of our sins and washes them away. You really, you really understand that now. You really got that grasp on what's happening. Have you, ever, have you ever known you did wrong and you felt guilty? You ever done that? Whatever. I, I won't give you too many examples, just one that I've given you before, and that is when I said something to my mama, she was standing there. I had to sink washing dishes. We just got through eating supper. And my, I was a, in elementary school. And my next door neighbor, Bob, his mom and daddy had bought him a teeter saw. What what'd you call them things? Anyway, the things that does that. And, and man, it nice. Me and Bob get on that thing and we go to it. We're just rocking and rocking. Rock. And I ate supper that night. And after I got through eating supper and I was sitting at the table, mama was up there washing dishes. And I looked at them. Man, I wish you and Daddy were more like Bob's mom and Daddy bought me one of them teeter-totters. And I immediately, all of a sudden, I mean, I was just a little kid, but it hit me. What a dummy I was. She had just cooked our supper. And here she was over there washing dishes, cleaning up from our supper. And I am telling her I wish she was more like my neighbor's mama. That wasn't a good day. That was, and my mama did not get mad and turn around and throw the rag at me or anything like that, which she should have done probably. But I sensed the guilt. You, you, you've sensed guilt before because of something you did. I uh, hope you, you never embarrassed yourself in front of your mama like that. But whatever you've done and you knew immediately you should not have done it and you had this sense of guilt inside of you, I got good news for you. Jesus takes all that guilt and washes it away. He takes the guiltiness away. And we're clean. We've been made whole. Our sins are gone. Glory. Glory. Let me give you two more. One is in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And here you're told what we're supposed to be about. Ephesians chapter 6. going to read about seven or eight verses here. Beginning with verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10. You know them. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, take in the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Lord, or the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, wait a minute. You know what those are about. 
God's just reminding us we are soldiers in the army of God. We are. And it's what we're supposed to look at ourselves. You know, I, I, we're living in a society, and I, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to be honest with y'all, one of the things I'm a little worried about for the future is um, what some liberal politicians might try to do about our guns. I mean, I, I got an opinion about that. I like the Second Amendment. I thank God for it and the wisdom of our forefathers. But I would have you to realize, whenever they start hollering and preaching and teaching, oh, you Christians are supposed to be loving everybody and kind to everybody. Okay, you know there's two verses in the New Testament that deals from Christ about a sword. One is when he was talking to them and he said, if you don't have a sword, sell your jacket and go get one. That's straight from Jesus. I, I like the commandments. I try to obey him. Amen? Oh, well. Second one. What? You know this one. Who cut the guy's ear off? Peter. Peter cut off Marcus's ear. Go away, hold time out. Peter was in a prayer meeting with a sword. They were out there. Peter and James and John and Jesus were having a prayer meeting out there in the garden, and Peter had his sword with him. Let that sink in. I'm sorry. I I do not agree with these folks who want to hoop and holler and scream and talk about how we need to be always uh, willing to give up our weapons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and just get along with everybody and love everybody and don't try to do anything. No, no. I, I believe with all my heart that God put men here to protect their families. That's one of our responsibilities. I believe that. I really do. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, but I read the, the sword. That was like a 357 Magnum in that day. Or a 45 Magnum, something. It was good. It was the best you could do. It was the most powerful weapon they could have. And there Jesus said, if you don't have one, get one. Peter kept one, and he used it. Now, Jesus did scold him. He didn't need to use it. Jesus was able to handle the situation and told him so. But he used it because that was a manly thing to do, defend the family and the friends and himself. Uh, uh, Wait, wait a minute. Do you understand what these scriptures in Ephesians 6 are talking about? God is talking about you and me putting on the whole armor of God so that we can be soldiers in the army of the Lord. Now, I realize right there we're not talking about swords and we're not talking about 357 magnums or anything like that. We're talking about putting on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, a uh, girdle uh, of truth, and the shoes of the gospel, and the helmet of uh, no, the hel the uh, sword of the Lord, which is the, the word of God. And we're to put all those things on and carry them. And be ready to stand against that which is evil. Yep. Yep. One more. Now I'm talking about things that God says you are. I mean, it, you can take all ten of these that I've, I'm, I've listed nine. You can take all ten and you can go into the Word of God and you can simply read in there where God says we are. From the fact that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world and a child of God and we are to uh, homeowners that God has made and prepared for us a home. We are empowered according to Acts 1.8 and we are to be witnesses and we will be witnesses one way or the other. And we are the temple of God and we are a new creation. Uh, we are soldiers in the army of God. Now, all of those things is what God says we are. I am who you say I am. That's what that song says. I am who you say I am. And I like that song. I think that's a good one. But it is one more thing. And the song even says this one. It's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I'm forgiven. Glory, hallelujah. And, I, and I'm serious as I can be. You, most of you probably don't have any ideas about having a past that's as rotten, uh, selfish as, as mine was. But I'm here to tell you something. I can say hallelujah. It's forgiven. It's gone because it's been put under the blood. Amen? Everybody that gets saved, all of their sins are washed away. Whew. That's good news. That's the hallelujah good news. We could cut loose here and uh, start singing. I might even try to join. <laughs> Jonathan knows I don't need to, but I might would try. Yeah.
forgiven. God's not going to hold against Daryl Quinn that which he did when he was 20 years old. Nope. That which I have done since then, because I pray pretty regular, i got to be honest with you, and uh, I, I jokingly cut up with a lot of y'all from time to time about, well, I, I say uh, young man or young woman, and, and we ain't young no more, and, and I, I say, well, I ask God to forgive me every day, and I do. I do. I'm sincere. I believe we need to. I believe we need to keep our sin account up to date and asking God to forgive us because it can build up and build a wall between us and God if we don't try to deal with it. And, and so I'm here to tell you, though, I know I'm forgiven. What I did as a dumb teenager has been washed away. It's been washed away. Yours, if you've asked Jesus to save you, is. I just encourage you to stay in a, a daily prayer life, communicating with God, so that when you do mess up, and you will, you can take a deep breath and go to God and ask Him to forgive you. And by the way, this verse, 1 John 1, 9, we use it in soul winning. I use it all the time when I'm witnessing to somebody about asking Christ to be their Savior. I almost always go to this verse of Scripture. But the truth is, this verse was written to save folks. John was writing to believers. When you sin, he'll confess it. He'll forgive it. Are you who he says you are? Yes. Yes. Just maybe we need to start acting like it and live up to it. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, I thank you that your word teaches us very clearly on many occasions about how you have dealt with us and our sins and our past. And Lord, thank you. And Lord, how you have empowered us and indwelt us with your precious Holy Spirit to enable us to be witnesses for you in a positive way and not negative. Lord, thank you for these teachings. And, and Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to realize that as we go into this season of the year of Thanksgiving and Christmas and all the the things that normally go on, may we keep you in the middle of what we do for your glory. Then I know it will be good for us. It's in Jesus' sweet name I pray.